So, um, I want to ask, um, this week of, of Sukkot has, um, the Feast of Tabernacles, I'm going to ask somebody to say, what is Tabernacles? Tents, a booth. When you're out there, what? Shelters, okay. Okay. When God says, I will tabernacle with them, what does he mean? Guys. Dwell. Dwell. Well, what does it mean? Next door neighbor or? Live with them. When you live with somebody, can you do it without um, challenges? No, it's intimacy. That's the word we use is intimacy. Um, so, um, I want to some if uh, if there could share what the Lord has shown you through this wilderness time this week. What the Lord has shown. You know, when, when, if Jesus is the light, and intimacy means drawing close to, and Jesus is our tabernacle, and we're drawn close to the light, what happens if a dark room is exposed to a lot of light all of a sudden? Um, there's no more darkness. No more darkness, okay. That's... And, that, and that's if the light is shining on something which casts a shadow. Okay. So let's say it's, it's, it's in a, Behind a cabinet, and you find a whole bunch of lint. What does the light do? Uh, show hidden stuff. It shows the hidden things. So Sukkot tends to show the hiddenness of our lives, but not to cause us to despair, but to cause us to draw near to God. What does James say? Where God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Um, where uh, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and He shall flee from you. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. God will lift up your hands. So, <coughs> what has um? I'll open it up. What what has the Lord shown you through this intimacy time? What has he through this week? What have you learned? What um, you guys have anything? Do you guys have anything to share through this week? If you look, if you were to, this is also the eighth day, the last great day of the feast. We've been praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit um, to look back. Shabbat is always a day of looking back at what the Lord has done for the week. What has the Lord done during Sukkot? I mean, do you guys have anything to share? Maybe, no. Isaiah, sorry. Well, Sean, he did things for us in our family. Oh, I don't know if you can share. Oh. What do we feel comfortable sharing? Yeah, the Lord has just shown us um, eating, eating things in the heart of our son and our family. Uh, very unpleasant. <laughs> But still, at least came to light. So that happened, and just a victory over uh, our, for our foster child too. So all in the family. Or any any teaching instruction for for the next words. season, whatnot. <clears throat> Anything particular? Um, for the next season, um. So we had a, a visit by our social worker this week, and she basically said, you know, you have to stand firm, hold your ground. That was kind of like her words in terms of um, fostering baby, because um, we're we've been wondering, like, okay, are we going to be adopting her or not, or what's the answer? So there's no answer. There's no answer. The answer is, we don't know. We just have to 
stand our ground and stand firm. <laughs> so that's kind of the word for this season, for us. What am I speaking? Whatever you learned, um, called anything that the Lord shared with you or impressed upon you or reflections on the Yeah, it is on the spot. Um, um, one of the things that the Lord brought up this week <clears throat> for me um, in uh, preparing for uh, the discipleship course that we we're teaching um, was the identification with Christ in basically th three different areas um, and uh, the death identification with the death of Christ is probably the most um, talked about where that's where our justification occurs and that substitutionary act where we're now um, made righteous before God. Um, and then resurrection when we recognize that we're risen with Christ, um, then we have new life and an ability to interact with the Lord. But um, the being ascended with Christ, being seated in the heavenly places, has been sort of a like a quandary as to what does that really mean and how does that interact with my life? What does that look like? How does that affect the way I think about living here on earth? And... Um, so I was really asking the Lord about that this week. You know, like, what what does that mean to be seated in the heavenly places with the Lord, uh, with the Lord Jesus? And last week we had gone over um, <clears throat> the uh, seventh seal and the saints and how they're right there at the throne of God. And um, as I was just contemplating, meditating on that particular aspect... Um, I realize that it's a change in vision that he's given us. We're no longer of this world, but of the heavenly realm. And part of our sanctification process is not just removing sin um, and changing governments and thinking in terms of no longer uh, end product and, and so forth, but faithfulness, you know, exchanging selfishness for love. Um, you know, all those things happen, but we literally see the whole world differently. We're now, instead of looking up, reaching, and grasping towards heaven, we're actually looking down, back on earth. And um, it's a different perspective altogether. And so I was asking the Lord, well, what does this look like? Like, what would it, what would it look like to really grab hold of the idea of being seated in the heavenly places with Christ and... I was brought back to several different passages in um, Christ's life where <clears throat> he talks about doing only what he sees his father doing and saying only the things he hears his father saying. Well, where was Christ's father? He was in heaven, but he was here on earth. And yet he had a connection with his father. He could see and hear what his father was doing. His mindset was in heaven. And his purpose, and he taught us to pray, that things would be done here on earth as they were done in heaven. So he had a, a concept of a heavenly realm and bringing that to earth. In fact, the whole message that he proclaimed was the kingdom of heaven is here. It's, it's at your midst. It's right at the door. It's, it's coming upon you. That, you know, all the way through the gospels, that was his message. Um, and then there are other evidences, like when he talks about how he doesn't have a home here on earth, and that didn't seem to bother him at all, because he knew his citizenship was in heaven. Paul talks about that, our citizenship being in heaven. 
And then um, as he was standing trial, um, and he's being questioned, I think, by Pilate, it was, um, my kingdom is not of this earth, but it's, it's of heaven. So he lived in this awareness of the heavenly places. And I think that's a part of identification that I hadn't really grasped that we need a, not just, um, we need a change in vision. Like our vision needs to be coming out of the heavenlies. And that's what the Lord wants for us. So that when we interpret the things that happen here on earth, we don't interpret them from an earthly perspective, but from a heavenly perspective. And that changes everything else, you know, everything else. From, you know, the earthly perspective, Christ was a failure. He didn't establish a kingdom here on earth. He lost most of his followers. Um, he died and sort of disappeared off the map. Um, and, and at an early age. And, um, and yet from God's perspective, it was a raging success because he conquered sin and death. He did everything he came to do. He was perfectly obedient. And he set up the foundational work for um, <clears throat> many sons and daughters being brought into the kingdom of heaven. That was the whole plan. But it was a spiritual setting up, not a physical one. Um, and so I can't interpret the failures of my life from an earthly perspective because what seems to be a, a failure here may actually be a raging success in God's, uh, by God's standards. So that was, I guess, the, the meditation of the week for me. Father in heaven, your words are always true. Lord, this is a message that I know this is yours. And I just ask for your guidance in speaking it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the way we have... Um, we were given a word many years ago. In uh, Maybe not so many, but when we were in Israel. Worship begins at home. And to you who don't, who are not here, we worship at home. And uh, in, even in the Old Testament, on the Sabbath, it was really neat. Each man on Sabbath was at his own tent. Folks, read to your kids. Get with them. Read your Bibles. Get in prayer and in the Holy Spirit. Praying at all times in the Holy Spirit, as Jude says. Be open with the kids. Be open with each other. And this next message, I, I didn't, guys, expect to give a message like this, but it's, I'm like, oh my goodness. It's just all converging. Um, we're, exactly what Leanne was saying about seeing from a heavenly perspective. You know, the, the issue that we're to raise the dead. Yeah. Well, what is the truly dead? Reinhard Bonnke says that um, the great Jesus said, he quotes in his book, Taking Action. Uh, he says that the greatest work, the greater work that we do as Jesus went to the Father was we can cry out salvation, preach the good news, and people turn. The greatest miracle is a changed heart. And that's what he's addressing. He makes a statement <coughs> that th that is the true death that is risen. is when a person who is held captive by the devil to do his will is now raised to new life to do the will of Jesus Christ. That is true raising the dead. That is true salvation. That is a true miracle. To take... You were never taught it? Well, today's the first day for it. Where someone who is an unregenerate, filthy, or moral, 
either way, now starts living completely and solely for Jesus Christ. I say that is the most miraculous miracle is when a person repents. I, I love uh, Leonard Ravenhill. The, the greatest miracle is when, a ho- is when a holy God comes into an ho- unholy world, takes an unholy person, makes him holy, puts him back in the, holy, in, uh, in the unholy world, and keeps him holy until he's back in the holy presence where he takes where God takes dead men makes them alive not just cleans you up he makes you new from the inside out he takes you who were Adam who was dead and says now you are alive by Jesus Christ because it's not just any old life it's my life in you that is the greatest miracle well rejoice so, we don't see things according to how God sees things, or at least not yet. It's being the transformation process. Going to John 3. Um, John 3, verse 16. For God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. That really sparked some things. So, but wait a minute. So I'm living, I'm breathing, I have a pulse, I have ox- you know, oxygen, carbon dioxide exchange, I eat, I sleep. You mean I was going to perish? You mean I perished? Like, will not perish. Like, no longer. You, you, you won't perish. You'll have everlasting life. That doesn't make any sense. But, we, but Paul says you were dead in your trespasses. You were, pardon the analogy as we use in this world, we were living dead. Animated, but inside we're dead. For God did not send His Son into the world that He might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. We were a sinking ship, guys. Anyone who believes in Him is not condemned. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned. Jesus came as a res- on a rescue mission because He has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This, then, is the judgment. So I want to do a little substitution here. So it says here, light, tw- uh, three times in, um, in these, uh, twice in verse 19, once in verse 20, and then once in verse 21. And I want to do something. Take the word light and put in there Jesus. He says, I'm the light. He says, I'm the light. Okay? This then is the judgment. Jesus has come into the world and people love darkness rather than Jesus. Because their deeds were evil. Evil not just meaning sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Trying to manage your life without God. Doing it your own way. Oh, God will understand. No, that's evil. For everyone who practices wicked things hates Jesus and avoids it. Avoids Him. Now, this is something the Lord hit me. For everyone who practices wicked things hates Jesus and avoids Him so that his, this person, his deeds may not be exposed. This is really important. If you hate Jesus, you don't want to receive correction. You don't want to be open to reproof. What does Timothy say? For the Word of God is, uh, is useful for all things in training and righteousness, for reproof, correction, so that every man of God will be equipped for, and furnished for every good work. Or shall we say, instead of the Word of God, let's, let's substitute the word Jesus there. For Jesus is useful, not to treat Him as an object, but that's the whole point. He came to reprove us, to our lives are judged in accordance with His example. But Paul says in Ephesians, is this the way that you learn in Christ? That's right. Are you looking like Him? 
Are you reflecting Him? Are you willing to be reproved by His character? Or do you not want your deeds exposed? Every deed. Are you wanting to lay it bare? Or do you not want to say, and live a life of constantly saying, I'm sorry, I messed up. I'm human and I messed up. Um, this goes along with uh, another thing that was brought up this week. Um, <clears throat> to piggyback on what you've got. That in our flesh, nothing is good. No, nothing is good. There's um, The good we do isn't good. The bad we do is obviously not good. Um, it's it's self-motivated. It's self-satisfying, and it's self-promoting. And that very self-consciousness is absolutely contrary to the nature of God, who is perfect love and externally focused, full of generosity and giving. And so we are diametrically opposed to God until we become new creations. And it's Christ's life that's living through us that gives us any different action. So what we find in ourselves, according to Paul in Romans, uh, is two different natures that are dwelling in the same being. There is the former self and the new created self. Um, and that war between each other. And, and the self that was in Adam, that was of our old nature is still diametrically opposed to God. And their new creation, which is in Christ, and after Christ, is the very Son of God. It's, it is after His character and His nature. And um, so then our, our, our living becomes this constant struggle between which nature is going to rule over each instance in our life. And uh, and that brings us to like a Romans 12, 1 situation where we have to present our old nature as a sacrifice to be crucified daily, um, offered up as an offering and to say, you know, you have it, Lord. You, you take this. And by faith, I'm going to live out my day in Christ. And at the end of the day, um, you know, as, as we do this, in those areas where Adam rears up his head within us, it's, it's confession time. It's, it's agreement with God. I agree that this was wrong thinking, wrong doing, wrong belief, wrong, and it was against you, and I have offended a holy God. Um, and then repenting, turning from that, and clinging to the Lord, um, recognizing His forgiveness, which is sufficient through Christ, and His um, loving kindness towards us, and that there's no condemnation, but this is a, a discipleship that He is bringing us through to transform us <clears throat> into the image of His Son, and, and to learn to walk by the Spirit, and not according to the flesh, by getting that flesh out of the way and allowing Christ to live his life through us. And and when he does that, uh, it is his life that's being lived through us, not us being remediated or fixed or cleaned up, but but literally Christ through us. So um, you know, it was somewhat of a mind shift where it's, it's not... Um, you know, I've become uh, more patient or, or something like that. You know, I've, I have grown in my patience. No, Christ's patience has been made manifest through me. It was his patience. It's his love. It's his joy. It's his peace that passes all understanding, not my peace. It's not that my peace has grown or my ability to be morally good has grown. It's his goodness and his righteousness that's being made manifest through my vessel that is yielded unto him. And, um, you know, that's what it means to be in Christ. And it, we must recognize that it's not us getting better. We're not getting better. I love uh, a little commentary I think Shane Bernard did where he said, you know, there's never going to be a better version of Shane. 
it, you know, there's, it's not, I'm, my flesh is never going to get any better. It's still going to be messed up. But Christ in us, as we yield more and more to Him, when, when Christ is more in us, we appear better because it's more of Christ in us. And so when we say things like, oh, I can't love that person. No, you can't. You really can't. Your flesh is not going to love that person. There's not an ounce of love in Adam. Adam's completely selfish. He's self-promoting. And the only time he quote-unquote loves is when it pleases him or he gets some sort of benefit out of it. And so, no, Adam's not going to love the unlovely person. But Christ can. And so it's not Adam who's going to love that unlovely coworker. It's Christ that's going to love that unlovely coworker through you if you will yield to him. Amen. Let's go to verse 21. And this this is exactly the other, to the tail end of what Leanne was saying. But anyone who lives by the truth or who lives by Jesus, he's the embodiment of truth. He says, It says he is the truth. Anyone who lives by Jesus comes to Jesus. You live by the truth, you come to the light. Why? So that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. Guys, this is, this is going to be a, a poke. And I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. If we really love God, then everything we do, we're going to want, we are going to want God's work to be displayed. And by that token, we want nothing of ourselves. Oswald Chambers says, humility doesn't say, oh, I'm not, I'm not that great. No, humility means you don't exist. You are not in the picture. It's all Jesus. And that what you do is offer His glory. Hey, I just get to play. The revival we had, it was exciting for me because I got to play. Man, was it uncomfortable. But we, you know, Ramon can testify it was, it was all Jesus. Leanne can say the same. Jen, you know, others, they'll say the same. It was fun. It was exciting. It was exhausting because we were... But at the end of the day, it was all him. And it was... We didn't get anything of a personal nature towards us. But at the end of the day, we saw the name of Jesus Christ lifted up. John 5. We'll finish with this. <laughs> 5 verse 22 this is very important it's actually proof text one of many of the divinity of Christ of Jesus Christ he is God in flesh I've actually shared this with the Jehovah's Witness how not only are we to honor Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit Jesus is the name above all names. He is the central figure of our faith. Because He is the fullness of God in body form. He is the fullness of the Father. John 5.22 The Father in fact judges no one but has given all judgment to the Son. And here's why. So that all people will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Guys, here's a word of conviction. Anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Plain and simple, you got no business with the kingdom of God. If you are not actively, openly... Now, I'm not saying everybody has to be a walking evangelist. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? You... Okay, some people are like that. Like, you know, some people we know. Uh, but... Is Jesus Christ your author? He, it says He's the author and finisher of our faith. Does He start your day and end your day? Does He finish and, compl and, and complete it? Do you have all your... You know, I was talking with, um, earlier about... I struggled when I don't have closure in relationships and the Lord hit me. You want closure. What about me? Aren't I your finisher? And I had to repent. He finishes... It. 
In Him, things are started and finished at the same time. My completeness is in Him. If things aren't over, or things are not as they seem, as far as I check, as far as we know, um, uh, because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Whether someone died, cancer, sickness, an ongoing drug issue, somebody on drugs, back and forth, emotional roller coasters, you feel like you're in the wilderness and you see, you feel like it's never going to end. You don't know about tomorrow, guys. Because He lives, that's what you can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. And He holds the future. And life is worth the living because He lives. He is the author and the finisher. He is the Aleph and the top. He's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning of the alphabet and the end of the alphabet all in one. I've shared this with the, with the Hebrew word Et, Aleph, Tav. It is the word, the, it's a word that has no definition. It, it goes before a definite article. For example, the house. To say the word the house. It is, in he, the word et, it's, it, the, the best definition is to say, I am letting you know that there is a definite article following me. But yet it's silent, it's present, it's in the Hebrew, and what is Jesus saying in the very word? He says, I'm before all things, I'm in all things, and I'm letting you know the, the, that which is immaterial, that which you don't see, that is what is reality. What you see is temporal. It's going to burn. It means nothing. It's stung in comparison to the glory that is of Christ. Your momentary affliction is light. It's nothing compared to the beauty and the grandeur and the splendor of the King of Kings, the majestic Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Glory upon glory upon glory, to Him be the glory forever and ever. He will reign on earth in heaven and under the earth. To all things, Him belongs the glory, the name above all names, Jesus Christ. He is that S. He is that King. He is that One. That all glory shall be ascribed to Him. And if you are not honoring the Son, don't even think that all oh, I honor the Father. I love the Father. I love Yahweh. No! All glory goes to the Son. The Father handed it to Him. It's His. Love Him. Adore Him. Have your life reflect His. Because that's what that means. He is that Ed. He is before all things. The beginning and the end of all things. Friend, if you have heard this message and you're feeling the Holy Spirit tug on you right now, tell Jesus what's on your heart. Say, I'm sorry. I've been living my life my way and not giving you honor. I'm sorry. I've not. I've done it my own way. I've used your name generically as God. I'm sorry, Jesus. I want to love you. Take me back. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Holy Spirit, cleanse me. Baptize me. I want to live for you completely. Take my life. Do with it what you will as an offering. In Jesus' name, I love you and thank you for your forgiveness. Friend, if you believe that, Rest assured that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things that you need to know. Because the Holy Spirit reveals Christ. The Father draws the person to Christ. It's all about Jesus. Father in Heaven, I thank You so much for Jesus. Jesus, I thank You for Your life that reflects that we would be laid bare at all times. Holy Spirit, help us in every moment, every waking moment, to lay it there before you. To say, yes, I want to be reproved. Oh, Jesus, reprove me. Correct me. Guide me. Corral me. Train me. Break me. Melt me. Do whatever it takes to look like you, Jesus. Let this cry be on our heart. Oh, God, and let us never stop short. Oh, Jesus, keep us holy as you are holy. Let us pursue holiness for without which we will not see the Lord. 
In Jesus' name, amen.